Oh, it works, okay. Um, hi everyone, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for surviving after the first day. Um, I'll like, I'm not, I, I will not gonna take a lot of time, so it's probably a little bit pretty short talk. So and I, I'm gonna talk about uh, Fluence um, and what we are doing there. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna briefly talk about three things about uh, what we have today in, in, in the web, uh, how it works and uh, what's the problem with that, uh, the notion of decentralized web and, and how Fluence helps uh, decentralized web. Um, so like um, two words about us, uh, we are working on Fluence, which is open source, decentralized, permissionless uh, cloud computing platform. Um, we are Fluence Labs, we are a pretty tiny teams of engineer, a team of engineers. Uh, we are working on uh, the project for a couple of years already. Um, we have the, like, the first version launched, uh, like the first dev network, we call it dev network launched. Um, and we're probably launching uh, the officially uh, next year. So uh, speaking about today's web, um, it's um, there are a lot of concerns about uh, how web works today, but the general thing is it's based on server-centric model, like a client-server uh, application architecture where you always have a central server uh, which manages all the clients and like stores the like all the users' data, performs like most of uh, business logic, and so on. So if um, and it, it is kind of in many cases it's highly inefficient um, architecture because uh, like if anything happens with the server, it goes down, it got hacked, uh, like uh, it, it goes out of control, then uh, it, anything just doesn't work. Um, usually, like in, in if you're talking about HTTP, also like all the requests are not signed, so uh, there could be man in the middle. Uh, you can temper requests, and, and it's not really great. Also, this architecture is perfect for uh, corrupt governments, for censorship, for like any kind of uh, controlling and turning off service that somebody don't like. Um, and also, like it, it obviously doesn't work offline, just because like you always like most of your applications are using on your iPhone, like on, like on a smartphone in the browser, they just connect it to the cloud, and uh, you will stop getting any functionality uh, if you disconnect. And uh, so here is where we are today. So like previously, we had a smaller uh, amount of devices. Now we have more and more devices connected to internet, like millions of new sensors, uh, variables, uh, smart things uh, gonna be connected. Um, and it, it just, the, uh, the, the growth just uh, accelerating. If you think about future, so future is uh, bright, we're gonna have drones, we're gonna have autonomous cars, we're gonna have like machine learning, VR, uh, smart wearables, and uh, we're gonna have much, much more data uh, that should be, like, that, that will be generated and should be somehow processed and should be uh, the, the somehow used in the applications. And if it's all built on, on an old, like, way of building application that, okay, like, we are sending all, everything in the cloud, it obviously doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, like, the data amounts are growing. Uh, that's, that's pretty obvious. Um, they're growing very fast, like significantly. Um, and this is interesting picture. Um, so like from 2005 to 2014, uh, the amount of bandwidth, like the amount of traffic that goes uh, between uh, continents, uh, like increases like 45 times. And now it's, it's even more. And if we keep increasing the, the, the traffic we are sending uh, over central channels, um, we will not be able to serve all of the um, like new devices and new data that comes to, um, to comes connected to the internet. Um, yeah, like, in, and again, so like more and more devices connected. Uh, and this is also interesting thing is that um, this is private, like fully private Google network of Google uh, cloud infrastructure and Google cables under oceans um, and they have to build all of this uh, just to be able to serve 
uh, continuously in increasing amounts of data and like uh, new users and so on. Um, and think about that uh, the thing is like the whole of this world infrastructure controlled just by one company. It's controlled just by uh, like administrators. Uh, it controlled like logically. It controlled administratively. It controlled uh, like also by one country, basically. Like Google is a U.S.-based uh, company. Um, so anything happening uh, technic like on technical level, anything happening on like a governmental level, uh, on on uh, or like inside company, um, and we have problems like. A lot of stuff will stop working, will be filtered, whatever. So they have a lot of control. And also think about the hacker attacks, like the cost of, um, like the damage that that can be uh, that hack hackers can bring uh, becomes higher and higher, just because we have all of this huge infrastructure in the hands of, um, in, in hands of like small amount of people. Uh, and also like at, at, at the last uh, World Economic. Uh, forum, I think it was reported that uh, taking down a single provider, like cloud provider today, would bring damage from 50 billion to 120 billion uh, just because like everybody is connected to cloud. And this is kind of numbers comparable to hurricanes. So like after hurricanes, we have uh, very similar uh, damage. So it's, it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, also, like obviously, you know this, uh, all of these concerns about data ownership, data privacy, data sovereignty. If you go now to any media site, you will see, and you will, you will, if you have AdBlock or Brave browser installed, you will see how much data, uh, like different services, trying to extract from your uh, clicks and, and visits uh, to be able to serve your advertising. And this is uh, kind of silent model of the uh, of the uh, data extraction like it is it is what we all silently agree that like we are using these services for free then we're giving out our data but obviously it, it, it's not gonna uh, scale uh, infinitely because like people people start concerning a lot about uh, that you can like that advertising companies can manipulate uh, their behavior can manipulate their opinion because they know a lot about them. They know everything. You can like basically track uh, any person with direct data or kind of indirectly. And the same thing is uh, like all of the social media uh, or content platform that we're using right now, they are uh, like keep everything in single database. Like they own this database. So you basically, it's not your content that you created, it's their content that, that you created, uh, and they, can, they own it. If they want to uh, take it from you, they can do it uh, legally and technically. Um, and this is also the, uh, the issue. So they, they obviously use this to also monetize this content uh, by advertising to train machine learning models and, and this kind of stuff. Um, and like another thing is about censorship. Uh, this is the photo from Hong Kong protests right now. Um, and a lot of stuff happening in, in this space. Uh, in Russia, we had a very interesting story about Russian government trying to block Telegram uh, for like significant amount of time. And they basically blocked millions of IP addresses uh, uh, that Telegram uh, used or not like they, they blocked zones of IP addresses. And um, it, it led to the fact that in Russia, like in, in some days, just half of internet didn't work. Like half of Amazon AWS IP addresses were blocked, half of like Microsoft Azure cloud IP addresses were blocked, and it was like a chaos. It was like nothing worked. Uh, and it, it's so stupid, uh, just it, it, it happened because uh, founders of Telegram, they uh, refused to give our Russian FBI keys, like a encryption keys from, from their messenger. Um, and like the government has this power because of centralization of the, like the, of the uh, infrastructure and centralization of like how application works, like applications works on the internet. 
Uh, also Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong, I don't know now, is internet, was it shut down or not, but like uh, government uh, was saying a lot about that because they have this power, they have this ability. Uh, and uh, FireChat example, uh, FireChat is a mesh peer-to-peer uh, -peer messaging application which works uh, without central connection to internet. It works like between devices using Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi and so on. Uh, and people uh, continue using this uh, during the uh, internet shutdowns, uh, during massive protests, um, and it helps coordinate, coordinate and communicate activity between people uh, during such periods. Um, and so, um, Again, um, another like things that internet, like even besides censorship stuff, uh, internet is not really stable uh, in, in many locations in the world. Think about natural disasters uh, when you cannot basically reach your uh, relatives or friends. Uh, internet just shuts down, you, you cannot call, you cannot uh, text message. Uh, think about subways, tunnels, uh, like we, we are used to be, like to stay connected everywhere, but like it, it's really frustrating when uh, you got disconnected, uh, even like you in the city, but you're in tunnel, so you, anything, like nothing works. Uh, and think about, uh, for example, that uh, like on conferences, it's, it's, it happens, uh, it happens um, pretty often that internet just uh, goes down because too many people in one location, so, uh, and imagine that just we want to exchange some files or we want with you collaborate on some document. And if we don't have the connection to the cloud, uh, we all have like Google Docs installed, but we cannot connect to each other. This is, and this is uh, like kind of really, really, really stupid. Like 90% of software that we have just doesn't work without connection to, to the uh, internet. And this is, uh, what, what happens in the cloud space. So we started uh, maybe 10, like 20 years ago from uh, building applications uh, like in, with central servers, which we rented from data centers or installed at our homes. Like it was dedicated servers. So you take the server, uh, you, you install the operating system, you install web server, and now you can serve some, some database or application. Uh, then infrastructure started a little bit like abstracting out uh, with the virtualization, uh, so, and here clouds became really useful. So they allowed you to basically scale your application. If you have like a really uh, grow, like growth in demand uh, in your user base, uh, you, can, uh, you can scale easily. You don't need to buy new hardware and to coordinate different servers and so on. So virtualization helped a lot. Uh, continuization uh, was like the next step. Uh, it just helped to manage many applications across different uh, infrastructure, data centers, and, and cloud providers. And serverless is the latest step that we have. It completely abstracts out the infrastructure. Cloud service provides you just a way to execute some random code, uh, and it will be executed uh, on a random node, but with the guarantee that it will be it will be done fast, and you will be able to scale like immediately to millions of requests if you want. And uh, now we have a little bit better things to, to organize web. Uh, and yeah, like this is, and this is all about peer-to-peer -peer protocols, open protocols, more secure uh, things and so on. And here's an example, oh yeah, like it's a peer-to-peer, -peer, so you basically connect everybody, uh, like all the, all the devices together. There are no central servers, but there can be different roles on the network. So uh, obviously on your device, you cannot compute any like complex code. Uh, so there are maybe like, in, based on this concept, there may be like cloud servers, there may be like a, a CDN, folk nodes who uh, perform computations close to devices. And there are edge devices like browsers, smartphones, uh, cars, and so on. Uh, that process data and um, uh, that generate data and um, uh, send it for processing to folk nodes and like all of this connected and all of this uh, theoretically should work in um, without stable internet connection. Uh, and there are like decentralized file systems who are um, make basically the 
ability for us to have again like static web. We, we will have we will be able to have web uh, like web pages, uh, but on the peer-to-peer -peer network, and it it, it works uh, fine. Like there are IPFS, Swarm, Arweave. Uh, it works fine, but it works only for uh, static data for files. And also, like, think about, uh, when I think about file, like decentralized file systems, um, the, the code is actually data as well, and the code is kind of file as well. So uh, these systems are very useful to distribute and deliver data, all kinds of data and code, uh, between peers on the network without requiring any any centralized provider to coordinate them. Um, but they like, cannot execute you the code. Um, and this step forward is like, how can we enable the rich, dynamic, uh, de decentralized um, web and decentralized applications? And here is Fluence. Uh, Fluence is a peer-to-peer cross-platform uh, computing network which is meant to be faster, uh, scalable uh, than existing cloud solutions because they are limited by infrastructure. Uh, it, meant to, it, meant, it meant to work offline because it's based on peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and this is like very easy uh, how it works. It's basically the Kademlia DHT that organizes the network and uh, peers together. This is WebAssembly execution engine where the code is, is run, and like WebAssembly allows you to run the same piece of code on any platform, on any device, and WebAssembly is basically the new uh, JVM. Uh, so you can run it on a smartphone, you can run it in a browser, you can run it on a server, you can uh, send container with the code everywhere and run it uh, in sandboxed environment um, anywhere. Uh, and like, uh, it's Fluence based on, on decentralized file systems, which allow to uh, manage the state of application. So the data of between, between peers can be uh, delivered by such systems. Um, and if you think of like Fluence versus existing clouds, uh, Fluence allows to have like the, the, the best way to run application is to run the code, like to have the code and to have the data on the same machine. It's, it gives you the, like the biggest performance. And if you think of serverless architectures, they usually uh, have the data and, and computations decoupled. Like for example, data sits in Amazon F3 or Amazon RDS and uh, computation is run on, on uh, some random nodes on, or some random node on Amazon network. And in order to perform computation on top of data, they need to transfer data between uh, their services and between different nodes. Um, uh, Fluence allows, uh, because it's open network, it allows different kinds of code to be composable together. Uh, you can say, okay, I'm running, like I'm doing the application, it depends on uh, that API and that piece of code that available publicly, and I just like reuse that, I just plug into that code uh, and the network will find a way to uh, compose your piece of co codes together and run it uh, on the most, uh, on the machine that will, that will give the, the best latency and the best performance. Um, and just just quick example. So basically imagine that we have the uh, application on our smartphone uh, which we, which makes the like machine learning generated filters uh, for picture. Like we had Prisma, a couple of very popular application a couple of years ago, uh, and the way how it worked, uh, they basically, when you wanted to apply filter to your picture, uh, they uploaded picture to the cloud, they ran machine learning, like uh, they applied machine learning model to this picture on the cloud because it's pretty heavy computation and they uh, send it back to you, uh, to your device, because it was really like uh, hard to execute this on, on a smartphone. So if we, do, if we do it a little bit differently, if we do it uh, on top of uh, like IPFS and Fluence, we would use IPFS to distribute a uh, picture uh, on a network, and we will use Fluence to uh, run, to execute a machine learning model on top. Uh, and so we, we have two ways, basically, what we can do. We can upload picture to some node that say, okay, I will uh, execute this code the, like the most efficient way. Um, 
and it will get the, the, the machine learning model itself and uh, some like, any, any additional data uh, via IPFS transport. Uh, and or we can do differently, we can download the model to device and execute on device. But like for some cases, uh, like, like in this example, uh, executed on device probably uh, not the best case. It is better to upload to some, some like closest node um, and execute. Uh, but for some cases it works. So it, it gives the flexibility to execute in code uh, on top of data on any, any peer in the network. And on top of this, we create a compute, like, computing market. So basically, there are different providers that can say, OK, like I'm uh, renting out my computing power, my, my hardware uh, to the network, and you can execute your code on, on my network. We use uh, guest notion to, uh, for, for, to account uh, computing. So basically, CPU cycles as, uh, and memory, uh, as you have in, in, in Ethereum for accounting. Um, and like two words about costs. So because it's an open market, it's permission, permissionless market, any hardware can participate, uh, not just server hardware, but commodity hardware, which is much more cost efficient, but less reliable. Uh, however, if you connect the commodity hardware via the open protocol, uh, we have uh, real chances to, um, to make it much cheaper. And the second thing is, uh, if you think of the, um, ecosystem of open services and open APIs and open functions available um, on the permissionless network, they all can be reusable and they all basically are free. So there are no additional charges for cloud services. On Amazon, now if you want to rent a uh, managed database or any kind of cloud service, you, you would pay a huge margin. You would pay twice or more, uh, more than uh, renting the same hardware just on Amazon EC2. Just like for, for servers, they charge more than for just hardware. Uh, so they, yeah, like this, this computing market allows us to, uh, to organize the network in a way that uh, the load balancing between peers happens on uh, the in, like upfront incentive basis. So nodes on the network are incentivized to cache the, net, the, the data and the code in advance to be able to like to be ready to serve requests any time to give the client uh, uh, the, the best latency. Um, and this is like, this way they will be able to earn money. Um, it's obviously uh, allows us to scale between different cloud providers. Uh, uh, and the interesting thing is basically this computing layer on top of decentralized file systems uh, creates the additional incentives for nodes to store data. It, it creates additional uh, data availability without having Filecoin, without having like other incentivized model for storage itself. Um, and very short, like, so this is again the example of if I have, uh, the, if I need to execute code that uh, uses like another code and another modules and other functions, they can be found on the network and executed either like by different nodes or they can be just uh, put together on the single node and executed uh, together, and it will, it will be like the best way to do this. Um, and if you have such an open networks or such an open services, uh, there are really, really cool dynamics. So um, we can we can have built-in incentives for people who create open services that are available for other applications. Uh, because they can earn the part of gas that their services uh, consumed being installed and being used by other applications. So it creates basically the monetization model for open source developers to create open services to deploy them to the network and to monetize their uh, open source contribution. Um, and yeah, like the, we have the first version of network uh, running, up and running, it, it available at dash, that fluence, that network. Uh, there's an, our white paper and our payment and token economics uh, also like pretty interesting. Check it out. Uh, and there is a, just an example of first like ecosystem that we create of, of open services uh, that we create around uh, this protocol. We have a couple of databases ported to a network. We have a couple of implementations of cloud functions. We have some cryptography libraries. Uh, most of that built by community already, 
and um, we're looking forward to uh, making this infrastructure or making this ecosystem um, bigger and, and, and to grow. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, here is our uh, contacts. Feel free to reach me by email. Feel free to follow us on Twitter or join our community, ask any questions. Um, thank you.